almost we're almost done yeah, yeah. so um welcome everybody here to the martin siegel theater center is a big day for us it's uh, the first event of the fall normally we don't do events uh, before prelude but florian is with us and also claire agreed to be with us which is a big deal uh, for us um, so first of all, welcome uh, both of you. Florian flew in from Germany for the book talks. He was just at Duke University with uh, Michael Klein, um, who we also published a book with. And I'm Frank Henschker. I'm running the Siegel Center. We uh, bridge academia and professional theater, but mostly international, global theater and American theater. We are preparing our Prelude Festival. I don't know if you guys got the emails. We're going to have over 60 presentations and actually 17 locations. We have it a little bit bigger because we didn't do one last year, two years before they were digital. And um, it's a, a big privilege to have you guys with us. We are still feel like it's new territory again. Uh, talks in person uh, haven't happened so, many, so much here at the Siegel. A lot of it is on Zoom and is online now. We were one of the pioneers, I think, early on in Corona time to do it. But we believe in in person, in the liveliness, the bodies um, in the room, and we hopefully will reconnect and slowly um, also rebuild our audience and also find new audiences for uh, what we do and learn what what's really um, needed. Today, we're going to hear uh, from what we think one of the thinkers uh, in Germany and also one of the great thinkers here in America about performance. What does it mean to make performance? What is political theater about? Um, where is it now that great tradition of theater over centuries um, to be in a context? And um, so uh, it really, again, Claire and uh, Florian, thank you for taking your time. I'm going to talk a little bit what they do. Florian is a curator, a writer, a dramaturg, and he hosted the great art of assembly. I'm sure in the time of Corona, a lot of you have uh, listened to it. He also did it before. He combines brilliant uh, thinkers, artists, theater artists, philosophers, sociologists, and talks about what it means uh, to do theater and to assemble. Um, it is about art activism and politics. His uh, current project is Training for the Future, and he works with Jonas Stahl about it. And he was the uh, director, artistic director of the Impulse Festival in Cologne, Düsseldorf, and Mülheim an der Ruhr, very important um, in Germany. And he was a co curator in the multidisciplinary art festival Steirischer Herbst in Graz. And anyone who is a part of the international curator scene, art scene, performance scene knows that this is a very important festival, it's a great uh, tradition. And he's the co-author and co-editor of numerous publications on contemporary theater, curating performing arts and the relationship between arts and politics. This was what his book is about. I thought it was really a really good one. And after Hans T. Lehmann's book, who also was my teacher in a way, I thought it's one of the books that really uh, in a clear way points us uh, to, to some directions, asks the right questions. And, um, and I thought it was worth doing it. So we published it, we translated it, we paid for it, which we normally never can do. We don't have the money. Um, but I think this time um, it is important. His texts have been translated in more than 15 languages. And we have Pavel with us here from the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. He did books on Rimini Protocol, um, I think, Forced Entertainment, uh, and uh, many, many others. So it's worth to look at. He works with the Alexander Verlag uh, in Berlin, uh, which is our publisher, co-publisher, and collaborator for this. So um, this is a, a great uh, opportunity to have that cultural exchange globally, um, planetary, or as we say, I think it's what we need in this time of climate catastrophe, of a time of a rising right, and of the questions what we have, what is happening in theater, uh, out of that destruction that we are experiencing, perhaps some, some great, some creation will come out. And I think these are voices from both of them that help us to understand better and to learn. Claire Bishop, is a, 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 a critic and great, great professor here at the PhD program in art history at the Grad Center. We um, have collaborated on many, many events. Claire has influenced very deeply how we think about the, how I think about theater. Her books include artificial health, participatory art, and the politics of spectatorship. We actually hosted the book launch um, when it wasn't really clear that it became such an important, significant milestone, a marker in the in the, in the history um, of also of art history and her idea to look at art history through performance, the idea of theater and not through painting just or sculpture is a really radical one and, uh, and an important one. But she also moved on, uh, radi radical museology or what's contemporary in museums of contemporary art is one of her books, very important. 
she's a contributor, an editor, contributing editor in Art Forum, and maybe of one of you read her great uh, essays, very provocative and strong ones on the Shad or the Biennale and and the Documenta and others. And um, she is now about to publish two new books. And I think it will be very interesting ones: Cunningham's Events, versus Cunningham's Events, Key Concepts, and Disordered Attention: How We Look at art and performance today. And this is this evening what's also about, how do we look at it and how do we present it? So uh, both of you, really thank you. I apologize if I talk so much. If you have a cell phone, take it out for a moment. I'll do it too. And it should be off or uh, it never rings in the Siegel Center events. And so they would be great to have it here. I welcome also a Taylor Everts. We should say hello. She's our new Next Generation Fellow. It's the first event. She's here with us. And to everybody, we would like to say thank you, but especially, of course, also um, to the Goethe Institute, who has been over our decades a great collaborator and partner here in New York City. And we have Jörg Schumacher here. Um, and um, they have been a collaborator for the Art of Assembly here in New York. We also have Sack here. Um, and the intern, who, who is your name? Ali, you know, who came with us and she's from Berlin. And so she's in how do people talk to each other in New York City? So you're going to see how it works. So welcome, everybody. And um, Claire, I'll hand over the word to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ooh, it's loud. Um, it, thank you, Frank. This is very nice to, to be here again, sitting in the Seagull. It feels like a very long time since we've done this. Um, scrolling behind us, uh, a selection of images from Florian's book. Um, so you're gonna see these looping around. So rather than uh, going systematically through the structure of the book and looking at different case studies, um, we're giving you a flavor through a scrolling PowerPoint. And uh, you know, when we do come to a, a light on particular examples, I'm hoping you'll, uh, you'll be able to retain them in your mind. But um, let's start with this, this book, which is why we're here. Um, I thought maybe a good way into this was, would be to just read you a paragraph where Florian describes a particular type of, uh, of political theater, which I think maybe epitomizes the assembly mode of the art of assembly of the, of the different chapters that you have, because you'll see the page con um, the table of contents scrolling by at some point as well. And you'll see that there, there are different sections, theaters, assembly, participation, activism, identity politics, representation, all the important words. So I'm going to just read you this one. Oh my God, I should have brought my glasses. Um, <laughs> it all seems so clear upstairs under a bright light. Um, okay, so listen to this. Trials delivering verdicts on artistic freedom, religion, and censorship. Summits convened to wrestle with climate goals as, or, as or cultural policy. Parliaments that give a voice to the otherwise voiceless. Theatre in recent years has become the setting for a wide range of social assemblies that walk the tightrope between art and reality, a democratic arena built on a foundation of fantasy and imagination. By using theatre's ability to create temporary communities, its unique selling point as an artistic medium, defined by space, time, and shifting rules, this theatre not only reflects society, but also defines a container for trying out analyzing, performing, representing, testing, pushing the limits of, and even reinventing social and political procedures." End quote. Anyway, so when I got to that paragraph, I thought, actually, that's quite a good summary of the, of the genre in general that you were, you were trying to capture. Um, and so if I was to put this work into uh, the, the, the kind of, um, oh, thank you. Uh, now I don't need my glasses. Uh, um, put this work into a nutshell, I'd, I'd, I'd say that an art of assembly really strikes me as um, the outcome of post-dramatic theater encountering Occupy Wall Street. And we can say more about, like we can unpick those in, in due course, but would you agree or is that too reductive and simplistic? Uh, uh, it, I mean, that's the, the Twitter headline basically. You need to switch it on. Uh, no, actually, I like I, I like this as a summary, and of course, it's um, it, of course it's a bit more complex. But uh, you know, what I think maybe is the encounter is that both uh, um, 
post-traumatic theater and then the encounter with, with these square movements, Occupy and all these other movements, it was maybe putting the focus again on something which I think is in the core of every theater, that theater is always an assembly. And, and suddenly this became clear and maybe more sharp again. So, so, so in this regard, I think it's, it's an encounter, but it's, it's actually uh, towards something that goes for even for the most conventional theater, but uh, often is bit denied or forgotten. And, and, and uh, through, through this uh, politicization of the uh, of uh, recent years, I think this came back into focus. What, what is actually uh, the, the job of theater? What can be theater also be useful to uh, in, a, in a way? But do you know, I notice there aren't dates on these, but do you notice then a shift um, around or after 2011? Yeah, I think so. That that uh, I mean, there are predecessors, uh, but but uh, but uh, there was. Uh, I think that uh, it was a moment where not only activists were thinking that something had to change, but a lot of artists were also looking for it. And actually, for me, it was a bit working at Steirische Herbst at that time. Uh, we went to, well to Egypt, to Tunisia, and everywhere, and and tried to to um, to relate to that. And I was a bit. Um, disappointed that there was not much theater there that it seems like visual artists are much faster and in a way it's maybe true because it's like a it's a collective task so it maybe takes longer and then i uh, i thought uh, discovered that actually uh, one outcome of it is is this this focus on assemblies where theater has something to to offer which other art forms maybe don't have so so uh, and uh, and i think um uh, these movements were really giving a push uh, to a lot of theater makers and also visual artists working in the field of theater uh, uh, to, to redefine or to rethink their medium. Can we, can we pause for a moment and push on post-dramatic theater as a term? Because I know there are some people from art history in the room and there are also people from theater and performance and I know you're familiar with the term post-dramatic theater and we have some practitioners and exponents of post-dramatic theater here in the room. But uh, could you, you know, what do you, what do you understand by Lehman's term and is your understanding the same thing? And what do you take from this, from this theory that you, that you think um, helps you formulate uh, this category in art of assembly, and where does it differ from it as well? Well, I, I, what what the term means for Lehman in a way is that there was only a very short time span of dramatic theater in history, and uh, th but that took over the term so that actually uh, when somebody says theater, everybody thinks of dramatic theater, and he wanted to liberate it from that in a way. So so there was a pre-dramatic theater which lasted well for, for thousands of years basically in different phases and then there's a post-dramatic theater and this is uh, and uh, the core of it maybe for him was to say uh, that there is a theater that doesn't need to be based on text there's a theater that doesn't need to be based on linearity on causality especially psychological causality and to liberate it from that and 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 basically say that every signifier uh, could become the initial or the the the, the initiative for an, uh, for a theater work um so i think that was very very important for him and also to put the focus on um what he said is unique to all theater of course that the um that the production of the artwork and the reception of the artwork happens in the same moment and uh, that this is not this is also in dramatic theater the case but there's not not a focus on it so i would say that was his take but the the thing is the book came out in 98 uh, and basically none of the uh, the artists that today would be considered post dramatic theater are in this book uh, so it's not even for entertainment uh, i think the wooster group is probably in it uh, so so the term is uh, is also got a little bit independent from from his writing and for me um maybe the biggest difference or let's say further development to him is that he uh, and that's also very much this time uh, wanted also to liberate theater from the from the dominance or, um, or of, of content in a way that also political theater was if there's a political topic then it's political theater uh, so, so there was a shift, let's say, from content to form. Uh, I mean, simple, very much simplified, but but that there was much more fo uh, uh, focus on form than in post-dramatic theater and thinking of what does what are, do the aesthetics of theater mean? What can they produce? Uh, and uh, also very ranciere in, 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 in that regard. And I think um, for me, and I, or I think for a lot of theater makers in recent years, that's maybe the development also described in the book is that by this. Uh, well, the content got lost a little bit, and also the, especially for political theater, the um, the substance of the word 
the political or politics in both maybe um got got lost and and that they because the political was looked for mainly in in the aesthetics in the form uh, in in a way was here could interpret into a way that even saying like ah if a work is directly political it's not political so so that so that somehow uh, um i think there was also a feeling around the time when all these square movements happening that that uh, the political potential of theater is maybe not used anymore that there was a reaction towards an older form of political theater that was necessary but the new forms also didn't didn't work anymore and uh, so so i think it sounds very simple or it's maybe very simple that it was a movement uh, of saying okay uh, for political theater at least uh, um, the, the form needs to be political so the, also the way of working needs to be political not only the form of the of the performance but also how the performance is produced needs to be political but it needs also political content in relation to that and and to balance this new that would be maybe the development after after Lehmann's book that that I would describe, you also draw a distinction, I think, if I remember correctly, between um, the, it, the a, a different relationship between the individual and the collective, from post traumatic theatre to art of assembly. Yeah, so, I, can you remember that line? <laughs> <laughs> it struck me as quite a good insight, but now, of course, I can't remember where it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the also of, in terms of the experience, I mean, there's an interesting effect that in post-traumatic theater, um, um, the focus is so much on on the, the each audience member to create the work for themselves. Uh, that that uh, and this was seen as a liberation. There's not a one topic produced that everybody should see. Everybody gets, I mean, like in a foreman piece, huh? everybody sees something else and uh, gets something completely else out of it. But but the question is if at the same time it kind of individualized the audience and is that not also a neoliberal uh, neoliberal way of thinking like everybody gets their own work everybody is unique and everybody has a, so 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 i think it's not it's not going back to another model but to also understand okay the, what is happening there in terms of of, of the collective in in this uh, thinking about post traumatic theater that's that's helpful. Can, can we can we move then to assembly and its relationship to occupy? Um, because clearly, you know, the title of your book and the the theme of your podcast is indebted to the theorization around assembly that happened in the wake of occupy. And I'm thinking of Butler's notes on the performative theory of assembly from 2015 and Hart and Negri's assembly from 2017. Um, but the examples in your book date back to the late 90s. Um, even though they're kind of fairly well balanced in the between the 2000s and the and the 2010s so to what do you think is the relationship between these theories of the 2010s these post occupy <coughs> theories and the and the longer history of experimental uh, theater that you're surveying i wondered if you thought of the the kind of the the, the earlier works um, in your book as anticipating these theories of assembly or do they exist in some way as uh, in friction with it or are they are even challenging it at certain points? No, I think that a lot of the works, um, like participatory works of Shishi Pop and other groups, or uh, Schlingensief's works and so on, were were of course already, uh, yeah, used a lot of the techniques and 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 also had these ideas of assemblies. What they had with Schlingensief, it's a bit different, but which they often didn't had it was a political. Uh, let's say a political aim uh, it, it was more an exploration of, of of assemblies of being together and i think that's happened uh, well with with the assemblies ha actually happening and then also with the theory that there's a shift like when you look now which to which works a lot of theater makers refer uh, so as i said like before it would have been post-structuralist it would be rossier etc and uh, and all the french people and so on and and now i think there's a lot of referring to 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 butler uh to um to political theories like chantal move uh, uh, but but also to um, let's say um, uh, Latour's idea of the Parliament of Things, and so so there's there's a shift also in the theoretical interest, which I don't know what what is first and in which order it comes, but but it's kind of quite visible that that there's new interest in looking at theater also through this theory and not only to post structuralist theory. Yes, there's a kind of chicken and egg uh, uh, question around that. Um, so you'll, people will notice looking through these um, slides that there aren't that many U.S. examples in the in the book. 
of course this invalidates the entire project no um <laughs> uh no of course not but there is a question about whether this is a primarily european phenomenon though so in terms of the american examples there's Anne Liv young an experimental choreographer I, although i never really think of her as choreography uh the yes men which i would maybe group as tactical media and reverend billy um and you also discuss an example from korea but the bulk of this is is really european and central european um so can you talk about uh, about this? Is is this a is this a, a result of of you um, you know your writing from the position where you are located in Berlin, um, and you know so is this a, a you know a primarily European phenomenon, or do you see that the differences in uh, contemporary performance in the U.S. simply just the, the, the people are just not exploring this in the same way? Well, partly it's it's my limited view of things. I mean, that that's for sure that I don't. Uh, and also, I saw in a way examples in there not more like not these are the best examples on earth, uh, but but these are the ones that uh, stand for something else. But I think it has. Um, uh, I was uh, since you <laughs> said you would ask me this, I was actually wondering uh, also how how that happened, and I think there's different reasons. I mean, one is uh, I think that of course the. Um, also, post-traumatic theater is very much rooted in in a European context, which also has to do with with fundings, with institutions, and so on. And and assemblies are a lot of these works are when, when it's really about creating bigger assemblies. It's it's also about where do you do that? What institutions do you have to do that? And and there might be something uh, in that as well that that uh, that it's played played via via Europe. And actually, in a way, I don't really. I think the question: Why are there not U.S. artists? in it is not is actually not so interesting but the question is why are there not more other non-western artists in there and that's maybe also a bit related with with exceptions of certain asian theaters and certain latin american theaters that i think where which i didn't dip into is completely different theater traditions because that would make a completely different strand and there's of course a lot of assembling in that but it's it's really like a would be like a different different book so so this focus has also to do to do with that that there's a lot of uh, blind spots but part, partly they are just blind spots partly they are perp on purpose because this is this is a western theater tradition that this is in very clearly which changes and, and opens up and and so on but this is still rooted in i mean it's true having asked you that question i can now ask myself you know i should ask myself who would i suggest that you put in the book and it's true i'm struggling to find examples or i would have to change the terms of it and think about uh the way artists and performers bring together people but it might be around music or a more informal situation it wouldn't be uh structured uh through the forms that are recognizable as assembly with its uh, reference to democratic traditions also i also i mean i really this book focuses on political theater and political assemblies like we could uh, of course talk about nature theater in their group that i obviously admire uh, what what yeah, assemblies it creates do, through duration through uh, um, uh, going through moments of tiredness and and so on so i think that these are also assemblies uh, so there's of course work but but I, uh, the book has a very specific focus and that maybe is then not so much represented here or i don't know it maybe just tell me if you have examples I... <laughs> yes we can have a, a, a an uh, appendix at the end of uh, of extras <laughs> the new york the new york appendix, the new, new york appendix. <laughs> um i would like because i my default setting is to be a historian i'm going to push and i've already commented on the egregious lack of dates on your on your slides and the powerpoint but i'd like to try and put art of assembly into a historical context um maybe also to so that it doesn't become something like you know the relational aesthetics of of, of the past decade which you know a, a term that pulls together a rag bag of different phenomena and tendencies um under one curatorial umbrella um so I want to think about the kind of the longer history of, of an art of assembly and the, the examples in your book, as I said, date back to the late 90s. But in the last chapter, you mention every now and then there are mentions of different um, of different examples from a longer history, dating back to the Living Theatre in, in May 68, to the Brechtian Lehrstücke, to Soviet Agitprop Theatre, uh, and then all the way back to the Brussels Revolution of 1830, which famously began in a theatre. So what is the relationship between the art of assembly and these this this longer tradition? Is it a tradition or is it or is it just a curatorial, a, a snazzy curatorial rubric for talking about the last 20 years? 
just as a short detour, now that you mentioned relational aesthetics, I could have said maybe that this theater is also a reaction to re relational aesthetics, it, certain assemblies and bring, politicizing them, but that, that's just a detour. No, no, I think, of course, uh, uh, they are important predecessors, and, and maybe it is that it pops up once in a while. So, of course, without Brecht and Piscato, Piscato was, of course, doing big assemblies, political assemblies, and he's maybe the first one which were in, in a German context, at least, or a Western context, and you have, yeah, all the agit, agit prop uh, experiments in the beginning, later, they were less experimental, obviously. Um, so so I think it, it pops up, but it was short times. So even Piscato did it only a couple of times. Uh, Brecht was mainly writing about it, so it's actually more in his writing than in his, his doing. Uh, well, agit prop, you know what happened. So, so, so it was never a longer time span. And in this regard, I think, this this um, uh, this longer time span and this amount of works around it might might be I'm not a theater historian but it looks for me like like something something different but but they very much relate especially to many questions of the of the twenties uh, maybe you could say like also what does Occupy relate to all these movements that you have certain moments and maybe it's not by chance that when we look when were these moments in theater that these were it's kind of quite parallel to these moments in, in politics. So it would be the 20s, the 60s, 60s, 70s and so, so on. Um, but uh, I think there's uh, clearly a lot of referencing. I mean, Brecht is, Brecht is appearing quite often. I already thought like, okay, the Germans writing about Brecht all the time, but I think it's, it's his writings are uh, super important and interesting still from from what he imagined theater could be and and that these moments where there's a focus on on theater creating communities is is stronger uh, that would be something to look at historically but it's quite clear in the last 10 10 12 13 years could you talk maybe about the range of different types of work that you pull together under this term because we've, I, and it's, and of course now we have no images when I turn around. Um, uh, you know, because there are outdoor interventions, there are more or less fairly traditional pieces on stage, there's experimental forms of choreography, there are works that directly mimic uh, parliamentary forms. Can you talk about how, where did, where did you draw the limits? You know, how did you decide what came in? In, in a way, I, I would say that the, the title, I mean, the, the book has a different title in German. Maybe that's part of the, the thing because it, it's called Gesellschaftsspiele, which is not translatable. It's like a parlor game, but it's a society game. Um, so so um, really in a, in a more um, specific sense, uh, the works I would call uh, theater as assembly are really assemblies. So works of Jonas Stahl, of Milo Rau and, and others. Uh, and, uh, and the others are more mapping a field of po uh, political theater. And, and, um, and there I purposely also looked at the pieces that uh, function in quite conventional places because they try to produce a different relationship with the audience or the way how they are produced. Like, like one prime example in the book is it is a work by Anta Helena Recke, a young black German theater maker who took an existing play in Münchner Kammerspiele, which is one of the traditional uh, theaters in, in Germany. She took a play uh, with an all white cast and, and like one to one, like an appropriation art uh, piece, took the, the piece, everything was the same, the set, the costumes and so on, but had an uh, all black cast in it. And, and uh, this is would work differently in New York, I'm aware, but in, in Munich, in Germany, this this was quite quite a, um, um, yeah, an, an intense moment on stage. So it clearly talked about the audience. It talked about the production means in the house. Uh, so what kind of assembly is a theater, an ensemble, an ensemble that is all white and so on. So 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 this would be in a conventional piece, but I think uh, it, it 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 explains a lot. So so that's why there's a. A wide range of, of works and then yeah the and and not all of them are necessary would consider themselves to be theater as assembly i'm glad you mentioned the german edition which came so it's pu first published in 2019 and then this english version is is 2023 and in between of course we have the pandemic we also have you starting to do a series of podcasts with some very high profile and ex exciting speakers in january 2021 so how much did you change in the book for the english version 
Uh, actually, a little in a way because I, first it came out actually 2020. So it was like on the day when the lockdown uh, started, the yeah. book came out, which was already like to talk about assemblies. I mean, uh, it was a very good uh, moment. <laughs> so, so, uh, but, uh, but that means that these years were also quite. Um, well, confusing in many ways. Uh, what does it mean to have live events? What does it mean to assemble? Uh, and at the same time, not much happened uh, in in theater. So I, when I when it was a, uh, the English edition was supposed to come up, I was kind of thinking like, well, how much do I rewrite? And I realized like, in a way, either I start from start from the beginning or I leave it and mark very clearly where, when it's when it, when it's written. Because also there would not be new works to add so much. It would be just a reflection uh, that changed. So so actually, I, I I cut out some examples, some German examples, put a bit more other examples in, and then kind of try to contextualize it a little bit more. But but uh, it didn't. Uh, it was yeah. It, it, it was interesting. I mean, maybe that's a, not, like always comes the question. That, so with COVID, how, what changed in the in, on in the view on assembling? But I think it's too early to say. I, I I really don't know. I mean, I think something has changed, but but with so many things, I wouldn't wouldn't know. And the works don't show it. I don't know how it is here, but in Germany, we get to see all the works that were meant to be presented in 2020. So I can only so we are in a retrospect. What happened in a way is, but also with already with the German edition, that it became more of a as an art historian, more historic book, I feel like like it felt feels like and that came clear with the English edition that it may be about something that doesn't continue the same way. So so maybe it is something that that, uh, the, yeah, that it doesn't come to an end, but 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 that is is summing up something. And this was enhanced as a feeling uh, through, through the pandemic, I think. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to come back to that. I, I think. But right now, I want to use this as an opportunity to ask you the kind of awful question that I'm asked endlessly when I give talks, which is all about measuring efficacy, right? So if this is political theater, how do we know when something is, how do we evaluate how successful this is? What kind of criteria do we bring to this work? It's I hate this question, and I'm asked it over and over again. <laughs> That's why uh, everybody refers to this uh, Belgium example where the revolution started in a theater because you cannot really top that, I guess. So, um, so compared to that, uh, I would uh, may, may in a way because all the answers uh, that one can give are kind of obvious and, and disappointing. But but I, I I would maybe maybe then argue with uh, with with the. Uh, with the Butlerian uh, um, way of thinking, like the performativity of these events in itself is something that changes a certain reality. Like with, and I think that that I found really interesting about Occupy, uh, where it says like, so what did Occupy change? What is the efficacy of, of Occupy actually? But but already and there, I think there's more to it. But already the that people try to live and organize differently on the spot does something and, and it might not be possible to measure it in quantity um but i think that's the job of theater and these works in a way to 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 create to to create uh, um, environments uh, temporary communities in a way that try to think differently about what is possible and not and if that's effective on a larger scale um, that would be very difficult to say but to, as it is difficult to say if occupy changed anything or nothing we will uh, First of all, have a discussion about it, but second of all, maybe also only know in twenty years or thirty years. So, but but I don't think that any of these works in itself changes something. But in the, uh, but I think in in relationship with the square movements, with a lot of other artistic works, with a lot of activist work, with uh, with, with theory and so on, I I think this is a, a field where something can be experienced and tried out, which otherwise would not be done. I think uh, so so. Yeah, a bit avoiding the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's pin you down. You're a, you're a curator who's worked with a lot of a lot of these artists, and actually you don't mention this in in the book at all. That you've got quite quite a few of these people that you have programmed and and worked with directly. But what? But we'll get onto that in a moment. What? As a curator, how do you know when something when a when a work is is successful? When it's when it's been pulled off? When it's uh, when you can look back on it and go, actually, that was that was really good. And does that have anything to do with 
efficacity and here it could be efficacity in, in the the broadest sense of the word that could be aesthetic, aesthetic social you know a question of energy i don't know when well i think yeah in, in i mean Maybe it's first the question of energy. I think that that would be even when I, I, I used to be a theater critic for a while, even there I would say first I, you feel in, in the work that something is changing, something is different that you cannot maybe verbalize and it takes you a while to, to verbalize it. I, I don't know if that's a success, but that's a rare moment you have in, 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 in an artistic experience. I, that doesn't happen so often in theater, but it just sit, sit somewhere and think like, okay, there's something is happening and I cannot I cannot grasp it completely yet. Uh, so, so that would be my personal feeling for success that might not always work for the audience or whatever and the curator then you have uh, other have to have other criteria um but uh, but as, as you know very well in participatory projects it is about also like, is something happening that that was not expected to, to happen uh, is there something opening up a, a way of thinking about this kind of community or, or um, procedures or whatever that is that is tried out there and that doesn't happen so often but i think that's that's one one thing and another would be that i still would say certain certain projects have a political implication maybe even in small like Jonas Stahl's new world summits i think uh, where he, he, he uh, created parliaments for for people that are excluded from political discourse by being labeled terrorists usually uh, i would say over the time over time because of over doing it over years and years created certain alliances and 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 certain um, um uh yeah maybe certain alliances certain networks certain conversations that otherwise clearly wouldn't happen i think so so also this is difficult to measure if that in the end helped the Kurds in Rojava or the people in the Philippines or but 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 it had really for them I think an impact and then you also uh, and that's that's something else when you feel like okay uh, it, it changes something in, in in these lives but that's very specific. Can you talk about the public movement piece make arts make arts policy um, because you just you describe this work, which I've not seen, but is a is a work that assembles politicians from different sides of the political spectrum to generate new cultural policies. And you describe an example of this that gets sabotaged by a politician from the AFD, from the Alternative for Deutschland, um, and which I think would be, um, and it gets sabotaged to the point where the discussion breaks down. Um, and would be by any kind of objective criteria, maybe uh, a failure of the of the artist's intentions. But you talk about it in an interesting way. Well, actually, uh, I would say it was not sabotaged by the AfD. It was sabotaged by the other politicians. But uh, but maybe to explain it, there's um, one concept that I find helpful in thinking about uh, theater as assembly is the concept of pre-enactment, and maybe also in terms of efficacy because we don't know it. So it's a term. But pre-enactment obviously is the opposition of a reenactment, uh, so it's not repeating an event from the past, but it kind of try, it tries to maybe anticipate um, a political moment of the future, um, which is um, not possible because, um, as the politologist Oliver Meichert says, a political moment cannot be, it, ha it happens, it cannot be anticipated, it's never happening when it's planned. Um, but he describes the idea of pre-enactment as uh, he compares it actually to to uh, to dance to ballet even where uh, the dancers would train on the bar uh, for a choreography which they, is yet to come they don't know what what choreography will come but you you train to be ready for it um, and and so the idea of pre-enactments is in a way a training for the future uh, being ready for the future but also creating events that or situations that could be helpful if the event would happen so so this is a bit the the, the idea behind it and um, public movement an israeli uh, performance group uh, is using this term uh, quite quite often for their own work uh, and uh, and I found it interesting with this work, it happened twice. And I would say one once maybe it, it was a pre-enactment and was once it was not a pre-enactment, it was more a re-enactment uh, because they wanted to bring cultural politicians together uh, with a simple um, 
a proposition to say like, okay, if I would want to vote for, for your party, depending on their cultural politics uh, policy and not on other things. So what, what would be the reason to vote for your party? So we, we have a couple of more than you do here. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so we started talking to politicians. Oh, she did it in Helsinki first. Uh, and there it really was a, 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 a quite a big effect, I think, because all the po politicians they found really got involved in it they really went for for it they wanted to convince people actually for their cultural policy i don't know why and and the local art community was very much involved because there was the plan to bring a guggenheim branch to helsinki uh, which would have sucked the money out of all the other things so there i would say ah, a moment of a different kind of parliament with these politicians um, um, maybe happened. And actually, uh, I talked to people in the Helsinki art scene that say this was really also a moment that that helped building coalitions within the art scene. The Guggenheim thing was not built and at the end. So maybe this had really a part in this. In, when we tried to do it in Düsseldorf, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the state of Nordrhein-Westfalia in Germany before the elections, we went to all the politicians and said, like, okay, what's different in your position? And the conservatives said, ah, we are not so different. We really, all the cultural politicians have to work together against the mean financial ministers and the social democrats at the same, the Green Party said the same. So they, it was basically impossible to find a, a unique standpoint. Only the right-wing party uh, had, had a different idea about culture, um, which was uh, disappointing. And then we said, okay, but please don't, um, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, yeah or find find whatever is unique and be, make a strong point and the other thing we said d don't talk all the time about the right wing party why they are wrong wrong but say what you propose instead um, and then the event happened and all the politicians said that the right wing party is bad uh, and otherwise they said, said the same so so in that and only the right wing party guy actually made a used the chance to make a statement of something that was quite clear <laughs> i mean nobody liked it but it was very clear so 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 it it was really um in a way of representational theater i think it was very good it really represented the way how every talk show works how cultural politics in germany works uh, with this idea of consensus and so on but it was definitely not a pre-enactment and so i found quite interesting that twice the same work really had a completely different a different effect and um, uh, uh, and also different relationship to this idea of pre enactment. It's great. So the piece is a, a, effectively an index of the of the political taking the temperature of the political situation wherever it's wherever it's shown. You know, it's great to hear you talk about something from inside your experience of of organizing it. Um, can you can you say a little bit more about your position as a as a curator and and the experience of working with many of these artists that you're writing about and and how that informs your writing? Because this kind of you know inside nugget that you tell us <laughs> about this particular work is, is it doesn't appear very often in the book where you're much much more distanced and even-handed and not really spilling the beans about uh about what went right or wrong with the with different projects which is of course what we all want to hear First of all, I must say, I think I very clearly say in the beginning that I'm involved in a lot of these projects. So I don't think I'm hiding it. I actually, there's a full disclaimer, I think, in the beginning, saying that I write that I write from a very that it's a very subjective book in 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 those and the choice of artists. But at the same time, um uh, um because of the focus a lot of artists I, I, I admire are not in the book, and also actually uh, most even with artists that I collaborate with, like with Jonas Dahl, I didn't write about the works that we did together. So, so, so uh, my involvement with these works is maybe that I curated them or invited them, but I'm not so directly in it. So, so, so that, that's maybe something to say. And um, yeah, and I, I don't know. I think that a lot, uh, that. Uh, the writing of it, of course, is informed about how how it works. But but uh, to show the mechanisms of works is something that it yeah it doesn't do here, except with this one example. Um, when I when I was a critic, still uh, in Germany, the rule was like as a theater critic, you cannot even talk to an artist. You know, like if you would be drink a beer with him, you you're, you're like you're out. So so and then there was a change afterwards, but it was really the idea: the German theater critic is outside of it and objective to all of it. And already then, it was clear um, 
coming from Gießen, from all these other kinds of theater, when I write about this, this doesn't work because if I said it's crap, nobody knows why it's crap because because the rules are, of the game are not even clear. So so it's and even I would maybe not understand it if I would not talk to people and 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 uh, so so my getting out of criticism and changing the sides and becoming curator and dramaturg uh, um, had also to do with uh, that this kind of theater yeah, needs maybe a different kind of at least at the beginning different kind of explanation before it's established so i i have actually the feeling that always when i write i write from a maybe not from the inside but from a proximity i don't write actually i very seldom i write about things i don't like anymore since i'm not a well critic. i've noticed i've noticed except Bilo was, Rao was is a, has a, is a bit more critical because he's such an important figure but yeah but in general, I was going to ask you where you see the line between critical and curatorial writing, because there's something that's very noticeable in your writing is it's very even handed. On the one hand, you know, Jimievsky and Sierra and Renzo Martins, you know, you say they make very strong work. It's a very clear idea. On the other hand, there's a problem that they're merely replicating problems in the way. So you on the one hand, this on the other hand, this right. This is the, the pattern of your uh, of your writing. I noticed. I mean, every now and then you break out of it with with something. But it, for the most part, you're in the you're measured. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's always like this, but with this book, I I, I wanted to 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 lay out a field but i think um well it, it a lot of people are not in it that other people like like if somebody else would speak about political theater there would be especially in the german context there would be ostermeyer and and a lot of people that i don't even mention so i think my way of revenge is <laughs> like just not to have him in but but i still feel maybe that that is still uh, left over from my gießen time in these beginnings that i still feel this kind of theater is very is in the in the end with there are some famous exceptions and Milo Rao is everywhere and Rimini Protocol is more prominent but but besides this it's a small uh, a, a small part of theater and it still is not uh, even known by 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 uh, even a lot of theater people so so I maybe still I have the feeling it's still about showing this exists and why is it important then uh, so yeah it, it, it's easier for me to have a critical view on Milo Rao because he doesn't need my support <laughs> and not that everybody else needed in there but I st maybe that's still the feeling it, yeah. it needs to be still explained to, to a degree so that's why it's a but I also say actually in the beginning I also say that it's a partisan book so so it's uh okay it's I need clearly I need to go and read the introduction again um <laughs> you skipped the introduction I am, I am, yeah. I'm truly, uh, ticked off um <laughs> You describe the book as a, well, this is from the introduction, actually, I did take one line. You describe it as a searching book written about a searching theater within a searching society. Um, and the book struck me as having a lot of curatorial soul searching in, in here, right? You lay out some of the polemics surrounding particular works, um, not as, as I think we've established to establish, a, a, not in order to assert a polemic or a strong critical judgment about it, but in order to explore the pitfalls, the warnings, guidelines, and so on for this work. I wondered who you imagine the audience is. Is it potential curators of um, programmers of this kind of work? Like what would, what are you getting yourself into if you start wading into this kind of theater? Um, or is it more for viewers who might be uh, a little perplexed about what they've seen and want to, you know, Need, need to be led through it well i don't have too much illusions about possible readers but <laughs> but i would say yes it's maybe actually yeah it's it would be more for maybe more for viewers because that's why i also try to i really try to explain like every term like like and where many people say okay why do we need to be explained what is identity politics again or what is representation and so on but i felt like a lot of these terms are being used with uh, yeah without really understanding them and I'm, I don't go into depth but at least try to to explain each term uh, and 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 that is important in these discussions so in that regard I would say it's like for sure yeah maybe for an inform, informed viewer but but it in a way and again it comes back to about post-dramatic theater there's still no book for larger audience and Lehman's book which is 25 years old now which is very academic and not uh, fun to read for most people uh, um, is the only book that that tries to give an overview over something so so this is also very different from the field of visual art there's basically 
very little written out, outside of clear academia of then their PhDs and so on. But but if you're an audience member that is interested to to read something, there's there is not much. So so in that regard, uh, again to to maybe as a defense why I'm I'm why I'm still saying like yeah, why it's maybe not so critical. It's it's still uh, yeah um it still needs explanation uh, to a degree or no, it, I, it's it's very interesting to think of you you're speaking to the middle. Right? And the middle that has been perhaps forsaken in our society through the polarization of the of the culture wars. And that's particularly evident in your identity politics chapter where you talk about, well, there's some dangers to safe spaces and this sort of language of triggering. On the other hand, there's also dangers to outright antagonism. Right. So you're very this is the even handedness uh, really, really comes across there. Um, and so I wanted to, to bring this back to a kind of curatorial or, or dramaturg question. Like, what kind of skills do you think the, the contemporary curator of this kind of work needs to bring to, to this kind of political theater? And do you think it differs from um, more traditional types of the, theatrical presentation? Well, well I, uh, the, the term of curator comes, came rather late to theater. And I think actually it's still not very much filled with life in but you think you call yourself a curator rather than a programmer yeah which was uh, which is again something that i think in the theater context is different because because um uh, i mean wh while in, in in the arts the the, the curator is already a dubious figure and, and criticized and so on i think in theater it was for me a term to actually introduce something else than a programmer somebody who has a different involvement in it but also for me it was always uh, um I think a festival uh, could also have in itself a performative form. So, so what, what, uh, what is the difference between a music festival and a theater festival? So, so how can how can you also, in terms of programming, play with and and you know it from visual arts, but but for a festival, how can you play with one is when is a performance starting? Where is it happening? Blah blah blah. I mean, even with the simplest things, usually uh, usually does that, that doesn't happen. And I don't mean big festivals have bigger problems with it, but to say like, what is the curatorial form for it? Like when we did a project at, at the Steirische Herbst in 2012, which was dealing with all the movements at that time, Truth is Concrete, we decided to have a, a week-long program, day and night, nonstop, without any interruption, really without any break and, and like a clock going like this so so to 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 think about what what would be this moment of exhaustion how can it be represented but also to show we are not an activist movement ourselves we are an institution there's also violent curatorial violence to this program and and so so to think about uh, about um how this yeah how these assemblies function as a curator also that would be something i i would wish uh, in uh, from a performance curator uh, uh, because it's it would relate to the to the tools and means of their own medium in, in in a way so yeah that was why why i was always pushing for this term to just make a difference to the to the programmer if it was the best choice uh, to 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 take it from visual art is a, is another question but it was at that's, hand that's not what i was expecting you to say i guess because i was thinking of the again this sort of identity politics chapter in mind i was thinking of all of the mediation work you have to do with different types of audiences and how things can um uh, whether this kind of work uh prompts more extreme reactions than other types of theater and what kind of um, you know, social cultivation work you need to be doing in order to uh, tread this fine line between people demanding more so safe spaces or, or being uh, upset by, by antagonism. But I think uh, that's not uh, not in contradiction to it because I think like um, um, uh, the, the spaces you create would also be like like who can find into these spaces and who who finds their way in it and I think it's uh, it it would very much relate to the uh, actually I always liked to use Occupy Wall Street as an example for for uh, for something that is good curated if it would be that piece because my feeling when when I was here was actually you can go uh, and it was quite interesting people were friendly immediately explaining what's going on and you can go after an hour or you can come back 
uh, every day and at some moment you start working in some committees and so on or you bring a tent and move in but i felt like in terms of uh, of of, of um, adjusting yourself how much you get into it uh, how much you want to understand and at the same time of accessibility i found it quite interesting and i always thought like ah if a festival would work like this that it's so easy accessible uh, in one hand but so demanding if you if you go further with it that would be a great festival so, this is a lovely point have you ever seen that anything approximating that did your projects ever approximate that of course <laughs> of course yes and none of us were there so of course yes no I, but it's uh, but it's uh, i mean it's 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 more to put other challenges out there yeah. and then there are a lot of pragmatics and that's the problem in theater and with the festival you have so much pragmatics with the spaces and if you do a show at six in the morning who would come and you know like like i understand all the pragmatics and they will water it down and, and compromise is an important part in theater. I'm not against compromise. It's an art that always has to work with compromises. But at least to, to aim for something, uh, that would be already good. I have two more questions, and then we can open it up to all the rest of you. Um, so a few years ago, I was asked to contribute to this anthology that we, we were just looking at on my desk upstairs about assembly by two European authors, I can't remember their names, and I and I declined. I said I don't have anything to write about assembly because um, I felt that its validity as a rubric for the 2020s was debatable, and that this had really been fragmented. Um, you know, through the through the Trump experience, I felt like assembly was just not um, a, po a political term that had any relevance to us anymore. Um, through the culture wars, through the hardening of polarization, um, we we sort of, uh, the the idea of this this sort of rather rosy idea of a Habermasian public sphere in which we can um, discuss reasonably and agonistically, um, it, it seemed to have completely fallen apart into, into what Jody Dean, I think in one of the, the Art of Assembly podcasts, said, that, that assembly is a completely inadequate term for a situation of civil war, which is what we're in. So I, so I wonder, what are your thoughts about this? I mean, you're keeping producing, you're keeping on with the podcast, you've got your books, you know, like, is assembly, is this now a closed period or is this a term worth fighting for? Well, I, on one hand, I think obviously something has changed and obviously there's, an, there's a shift. I, I don't really know if periods are ever closed, but 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 there's a shift and, and also a shift in terms of looking at assemblies. But um, maybe it means that the scale of assemblies changes and where they take place but but we still need to assemble we need, still need to exchange we, I, I strongly believe we, we, we still need this uh, and and we and it would be good if the assemblies would also be larger than on our own bubbles and I have the feeling maybe maybe still theater can can experiment with that and work on that and I think these 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 are attempts to so so how diverse can actually be the people we assemble like what what conflicts can we still hold because also uh, well theater is always about conflicts and assemblies i think are also uh, always about yeah about uh, conflicts uh, and and this is difficult of course at the moment so with whom do we want to have conflicts with whom can we still have conflicts but but there's no i mean i think there's no alternative which is something i'm against <laughs> but in this case i think uh, it is and and of course like um, i'm i'm using quite quite uh, clearly chantal Mouffe's concept of uh, agonistic pluralism uh, of the idea that that uh, democracy should be an agonistic pluralism and and often it cannot be anymore as we can see uh, and that's exactly what she says because if it is then it's a civil war huh? so so but can we still at least in in certain artistic context try to re try to try it out to rehearse it to see what are the limits uh, but it does, yeah so on one hand i totally agree on the other hand i don't think we have an i mean we, we cannot give up on it what would that be mean so um, so assembly, I'm left by, by the end of the book thinking that assembly sort of has a, a kind of a, a, a bifurcated um, uh, meaning for me by the end of the book. So on the one hand, it seems, I feel like it's a nostalgic relic of European social democracy, <laughs> on the one hand, right? <laughs> And on the other hand, when I think of what assembly might mean here, what comes to mind is not Occupy, but Trump rallies, right? The right wing assembly as, as mobilized by the right. 
And so I wondered if, you know, can we think of the, you know, would you see a right wing rally as an assembly or are there fundamental differences? You already mentioned moves agonistic pluralism. And I guess there's a question of like, do we see that or not in in a rally? But um, but you know, where where are we with the with assembly and the right? I guess is what I want to leave as well, the final question. On one hand, I I mean I'm 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 not defining assembly that closely, but but I would say a rally is maybe never this kind of assembly. So what what these kind of assemblies usually are, are deliberating uh, uh, assemblies. So it would be neither left nor right wing demonstration would be assembly in in in, in this regard. So so and uh, from what I know about Trump rallies, deliberation is not their strong part. Um, so so that that would be one thing. On the other hand. Uh, not only for assemblies, for everything, it changes with the in, with the well with with the growth of the right wing, of with the taking over of techniques uh, of the right wing. You know, uh, for years I thought uh, an artist is per se a leftist, uh, and, and and then I already at that time coming to Russia, I saw ah oh, no, artists can be right wing, uh, and now we can see it everywhere. So so I think it's something where. Um, uh, where not only what in terms of assemblies, but in all, all artistic expressions, we have to see, okay, uh, certain means are not per se liberal or leftist. Uh, they, they can be used from all sides and they can be also skillfully used from, from other sides. Uh, but still, I would say the idea of deliberating of uh, and of um, pluralism uh, would, would be something that is not really occupied by the right yet. And uh, maybe also that would be the limits of what they could occupy. So, yes, watch this space. Yes, let's have let's have some Q and A. Q and A. Um, tell if you could go. So, if there are comments or questions or something, Peter. Thank you. Um, really, um, really fascinating talk because I think the. The question of assembly is so interesting to think about now. And I wonder whether, on the one hand, we have Butler's notion, which is no longer working in terms of a kind of idea of assembly that is full of hope and potentiality and possibility. On the other hand, as, as Claire so rightly pointed out, in the United States, assembly is the Trump rally or or a, a, another form of assembly is the, you know, a couple of weeks ago here, there was this flashpoint assembly at Union Square where some social media people announced that they were going to give give away um, um, electronic games and suddenly there were more than a thousand people on the square descending I was actually there in the middle of it and it was quite uh, it was an assembly of sorts and it had a certain kind of chaotic sensibility that one might think about in in context of the Trump rallies as well that there's a certain kind of performative anarchism or violence or something but I, I guess it's not so much the point of assembly but it's the way they're framed I think because in some ways what you're talking about is the framing of an assembly the framing of an apartment a parliament or the framing of a of a kind of constituted group of people coming together to deliberate but I'm also thinking about the potential for other kinds of framing coming back to Claire's point about what happens if we reenact the storming of the the White House, the, the Congress? Um, if we actually reenact it as a as a uh, it, 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 the thought came to me after somebody described a performance that Romeo Castellucci did in uh, in Western Europe, where he reenacted the police storming in the Black Lives Matter, and he had all of these uh, actors dressed in New York police uniforms with their you know, highly militarized kind of garb, um, walking through the public square, behaving in a very kind of highly militaristic way. And I thought that was kind of an effective framing of an assembly of a certain kind. And what happens if we could bring that conversation here a little bit more in terms of the way that we frame the possibility of reenacting these kind of moments, not because we want to repeat them, but because we, we actually want to make them somehow available to criticism. Um, I mean, yeah. Th thank you also for bringing the question of the, uh, the, the question of framing in this, um, because that's something we didn't talk so much. I don't think that Occupy was political uh, was a was a theater piece in, in a way. So, so it's of course about the framing. It's of course all about 
this a bit Brechtchen idea that you create a situation that you can be inside and outside to observe at the same moment, which which in a political moment, I guess, doesn't happen. Uh, so that's the artistic um, a twist in, in in this. So the question would be like, yeah, is it possible to 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 frame this rally in a way that it would be uh, that you could understand something that you maybe didn't understand otherwise about it? Is would it be would it be what, what would be the the productive mode in it and uh, in, in 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 looking at it? Um, and I don't know. I mean, there was so many reenactments. Milo Rau also did the reenactment of the he stormed the the parliament in Germany. Uh, um, that was before the U.S. storming uh, um, uh, to to, to uh, in, in, uh, for the anniversary of the Russian Revolution and so on. So, but I, I, I never personally, I never really got the the uh, the the idea of the potential of reenactment somehow. But maybe because for me, the this moment of of uh, finding out something that I didn't know before was not strong enough what would you find out the structure of it how it could happen uh, which is the context where it happens or you you there's something i maybe also because it has the it has the idea of immersion uh, to a degree at least if you participated and i'm i'm very skeptical about uh, immersive theater in terms of its political terms because i think it's the opposite of what i mean it's like not not looking up at it from the outside, not trying to understand the structures, but but to 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 relive something. So 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 uh, psychologically, I understand that you could understand something, but I'm not sure that that's helpful. This is very interesting because I think of assembly more in terms of Joseph Boy's concept of social sculptures and your reference to the uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I was there at the beginning of uh, Occupy Wall Street, which actually started in Union Square as a student protest against the loans, the slavery of student loans, and they marched to, uh, to Zuccotti Park. And that was the beginning of, uh, just as a reference point. Also, uh, the Burning Man is an example of uh, a social sculpture that I, I felt could have applied to your assembly. Uh, you know, it started out of uh, the diggers, and then there was a group called the Suicide Society and the Cacophony Society, and they formed the, uh, went out to Black Rock and formed the early days of the uh, Burning Man. But uh, where does, uh, my question is, where does Joseph Boyd stand in your mind in this? Um... Yeah, yeah, he's in the book in terms of the because there's also assemblies of knowledge and and uh, and and this free university is uh, would be an example for me. I think um, why I it's not a stronger reference point for me is that as, and I'm not not an expert on boys, but uh, this 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 idea of an outside of the framing is 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 not in his concept. It's more like, in a way it's more immersive to a degree. It tries to bring people in and it creates structures, but it doesn't have this. Uh, critical reflection uh, part that I, that, uh, that I uh, fi find important in this. Um, but um, maybe I should look more into it. It could be that my question is just a follow up um, to my neighbor's uh, comment and a question, but um, um, can you be a little bit more specific if you don't find, um, let's say, um, the reenactment as a productive mode, what are so-called, um, for lack of a better phrase, um, this sort of uh, poetic theatrical image, speaking figuratively, that you find in your content of incredible theatrical works that you've um, described in your book, that you find most productive, forceful, and more subversive, uh, meaning modes of 
um, presentation. I don't know how to better say it in English. Um, I, I guess what I mean is that, you know, what I was would be interested in your book, not so much uh, the acuteness of acuteness of topic or the direct political content that makes the work political, but what are those methods that explode that that make that theatrical image much more subversive and ultimately political? I don't know if that's clear or not. I mean, there are so many different uh, different strategies. I mean, one that may, doesn't make maybe makes it subversive, but makes it political would be actually really in the form of also how how it um, thinks about the people involved in the work. So, so, so I think that's that's one one point that uh, uh, how how do you create a participation that is not only an artificial hell that isn't that that is not only just following something that somebody creates for you to be in but but what would participation mean as a in, in a as a, a radical thought and i think uh, these works not necessarily uh, that's not something to be reached it's something to be worked on or tried out um but uh in, in, since you talk about images i would say like the you know style would be a good uh, example for working with images because that's his his aim is to to uh, in a way to create counter propaganda propagandistic means and to create images and uh, and and uh, to resist the 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 propaganda machine from the right so so i think he, uh, he, what he tries in his work uh, with with the parliaments or with, with the new world summit and so on is is to to um to use images that we think we know, so it looks like certain parliaments, it looks like certain assemblies, but there are certain shifts in there that uh, that uh, maybe are not even visible in the beginning. That maybe create a different a different image, but also a different way of behavior in there. So, yeah, so maybe. We'll just pass this back and forth to different parts of the house. Um, my question is, I wonder if you could speculate on the kinds of pleasure that the art of assembly makes possible. Of course, Brecht talked about pleasure as kind of the highest calling of theater or one of them. For the living theater, there was a certain affinity between revolutionary politics and libidinal satisfaction or freedom of a certain kind. But in this era that we're talking about, what what what's enjoyable about assembly? Not a very German question, I I know, but I'm no, still we, curious. We don't we don't like to uh, to enjoy anything, and 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 maybe a reason why I um, didn't focus so much in the book is 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 because of all the relational aesthetics uh, stuff, which was so much on on the on the question of where we cook together, uh, which would be the usual answer to that. Um, um, no, but I think. Uh, uh, in in a way, I think it's for for the to, for the forms that really create assemblies. I think it's it's quite quite clear if if that there's an enjoyment of finding out certain things differently together. If you feel that's a situation which is not forcing you to follow certain rules and it's not participatory in the way that you have to do things that you don't want to do and so on, but but where you have a moment where you feel like you you find out something to, together, I think that's that's uh, that's enjoyable. Uh, other works are clearly also enjoyable to watch. So I mean, of course, they they use also as I said, they use theatrical means. Um, I, I mean, one example in in the book is the is the Church of Stop Shopping, and I would say, yeah, the the way of singing and the performance is enjoyable. It brings you to something where you then suddenly in a situation where you maybe think like, oh. Uh, uh, because first we thought it's about singing and being together and you end up somewhere else. So I think there are a lot of strategies of that, but maybe it's not the main aim in truly the, of political theater to be enjoyable in the first place. So so that's, uh, and especially re when it's about situations like, well, we, we were pointing at uh, how, where the world is going with the climate catastrophe, with the right uh, uh, raising of the right wing. So, so on one hand, of course, you need to create uh, situations where you want to be in. Um, but I think maybe the question of enjoyment is also less important for me than the question of uh, is it productive? Is it just you know? Is it um, which maybe also would be a question about resistance at the moment? So, is it is is the 
the horrors we are facing is is it repeated and you have situations where you basically can just say like okay i'm paralyzed by fear or is there a moment where you think you can you can engage in it and maybe my reluctance towards reenactments is also the the look back so it's more about like how can how can we develop in this situation still ideas of what we do with the future and how uh, what kind of future we would imagine i think some of these works try to imagine different futures maybe very pragmatic maybe in small scale so it's not like a completely different world but how could at least a little bit different the situation look like uh, other ways uh, uh, other works maybe try to train for a certain future and and, and prepare for a certain futures but uh, but the direction this this in a way has to be the direction and uh, and so, yeah, maybe this uh, in terms of um, being productive is maybe more important than being enjoyable for, for these works. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, even the, 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 the skepticism or the, the, the anxiety about assembly just shows us how unpracticed our assembly is and how we have forgotten how to make decisions as a group together we're so we're so far away from our own agency as groups as as collectives that we're unable even to imagine doing it so the the simple thing that this kind of theater does is just remind you that you can make decisions together and do things together i mean i think there's something so profoundly pleasurable and beautiful about even with a group of friends on the sidewalk deciding where to eat. I mean, that's just, to me, that's far more like an indication of assembly than a bunch of people coming to collect free products from a social media influencer, which is nothing like my understanding of assembly as an activist or an anarchist. Like that is consumerism gone haywire. That has nothing to do with the urge we have to make decisions together and do something different. And we have completely lost our ability to do it, as far as I can tell. Like we're so siloed, we we can't confront another uh, kind of decision. We're so uh, alone in our skill sets that we can't acknowledge other skill sets. Um, so it's great just to even contemplate new kinds of assembly or any kind of assembly at this point, you know, and then say, yeah, let's try it. And you know it, it's often a failure. We all know that too. It doesn't always lead to a good decision or uh, you know something you can move on. I mean, Occupy Wall Street was full of failed meetings that ended in tears and shouting and exploded social groups and activist groups. I mean, it was a mess, but we remember it. And you know, there's no question that it changed a lot of things for a lot of people all over the world. Um, so thank you, Florian, for you know bringing these things forward as assembly, as, as a reflection of that urge to be in a room together, talk about the future, explore the future and, and find a way because our, our choice is to, to not do that. And that doesn't look like much of a choice to me. It's a little bit like how we talk about public space. If you want public space to be public space, go get the fuck in public space. Hey. Don't stay home. You know, if it looks bad out there, go get in it. It's on you, you know, so thanks anyway. I, 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 li I like the, um, um, yeah, that, that these works remind us that we can assemble at all is actually a, a, a very good. This is the answer I should have given. <laughs> Um, so it seems like a lot of these works share a value system that involves pluralism and possibly can be framed as using discourse as a material. Um, are there other political principles beyond pluralism or sort of the val the inherent value of discourse that you feel this particular community of artists share? Um, you say they're generally left or liberal. Are there other principles like Rawlsian justice as fairness or that every individual's viewpoint is just as valuable as any other? Or can you speak a little bit to the very principles and values of the work? But I think they they differ with the different artistic works. So as I, so this and and my answer would be the obvious. Some yeah, some have a focus on solidarity. So others would have a focus on conflict. Others would have a so so. I think um, yeah, it's it's really. I I think it's rather for me. What's interesting that be, that besides that 
most of them are leftists and or at least liberals <laughs> yes but uh, but uh, that they have different approaches to, to to do that um and maybe since it's art so i would say the idea of imagination if that's a value is something that maybe combines them that i would say that uh, they have different ways of try to to open up certain imaginaries some quite pragmatic and some more flamboyant or more more utopian uh, but but um, this is i don't know if that's a value but that's something they they i think they have in common because they are artistic works also and or primarily primarily i mean they, they all have an, um, uh, an artistic um, approach Um, thank you so much for the talk. And I just want to say that I love your podcast, Save My Life During COVID. Um, I have a question regarding um, the concept assembly, uh, because we, I think a lot of us share um, a certain kind of value here that we belief in future and we believe that people would take agency to shape the future. Um, I want to ask what would you say to the people who would benefit from the concept of assembly but cannot bear the presence either physically or emotionally of assembly? Well, you should explain where that question comes from in your research. Uh, in, now or later? <laughs> Well, maybe now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it just goes back to your, you touch upon the concept of access in assembly. I'm just curious about um, a lot of, a lot of people like today we're assembled, we're assembled here to discuss this book. Um, but for those who cannot be here either physically because of they have class or other like responsibility in their life or just emotionally cannot be here, what would you say to them? Yeah. I think that's something that in the book is is mentioned, but but is not not really a lot about in there. So I would rather, but from 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 a praxis point of view, like we, it was a big, um, or it was maybe the ma major aspect of the last training for the future that Jonas Stahl and I did together in in, in Torino, uh, where we really thought a lot about how how these assemblies could look like, and and of course with different partners and 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 uh, um, investigating uh, different aspects of that. And I think it was that. So so I don't have an answer. I just say that it was an interesting journey to really. Uh, have a have a three day uh, this three day training camp uh, from the very beginning with this focus on on uh, on yeah with this focus um, yeah so so I think that's of course a very very important aspect of it um, at the same time I would say uh, there there needs to be more thought on this more assemblies in this regard and on the other hand I would say generally for these assemblies not all of these assemblies are for all kind of uh, for, for all purposes so so i think that the, that would be also an interesting which which assemblies exclude certain people because they for for whatever reasons out of carelessness or purposely because uh, of the aim of the assembly so that's something that that needs to be further further investigated um, but i think it's 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 very interesting big, big, and and it's it, it tells something that this um, since the book was finished three years ago, how much the, uh, let's say, an awareness curve also in theater uh, for this is just happening. So so that uh, if I would write it now, for example, I would already bring in examples, uh, which, I, which I didn't know of, of because of my ignorance, of course, uh, uh, when, when it was written four or five years ago. Hi, it's not quite a question, um, but this all this talk about reenactments and the limits of reenactments got me thinking about Dred Scott's um, slave rebellion reenactment, which is a reenactment of a slave rebellion that happened in the United States pre-Civil War. And I find that to be an incredible use of reenactment as a form, as a tool, insofar as it's both a critique of the kind of reenactments that people dress up as a Confederate soldier and as a, as a Civil War guy and go to Gettysburg and fight each other for fun in a sort of, like, to me, that's so perverse. 
But then you have this other way of like reclaiming a history that's often untold, especially in the United States. Slave rebellions are considered like something that didn't happen, um, even though they obviously did. And this is a way also, I think, of reclaiming the kind of archival history that's like in between the lines in a sort of Saidiya Hartman sort of way. Um, so I guess this is just a little push about the possibility that reenactment as a form could actually offer something productive in the kind of ways that we're talking about an assembly in the kind of way that recovers histories. No, I, I agree that my uh, reenactment bashing was a little bit, uh, a bit, a little bit harsh. Uh, and there are some examples that I find super interesting also. Uh, and, but, but generally I think without having written and thought, too much about it. I I I I uh, I'm a bit skeptical about this way of uh, of um, trying to understand history. Uh, so so for me, I think the the, the contextualization of this reenactment and uh, and and maybe the shifts in this reenactments would be very important because the idea that I can reenact history, I find uh, even if it's for the right purpose, I I'm generally skeptical about. And then then it would be. I'm but I'm sure. It, something can be done with it where where there are twists and frames and so on that that take care of that but but uh, yeah I have a, but i have a certain distrust against these ideas even so also the battle of orgrave or whatever that i found this was a great great work but still i'm also there skeptical about the the idea behind it lauren wants the future not the past so <laughs> Uh, thank you all for listening. And I don't have any words of wisdom to, to finish up with. But by the book, you've got 10 copies in your bag. So if anyone wants to buy it, you can be, I could have a limited edition signed copy right here, right now. Thank you so much.